The following is excerpt from my introduction to Beyond Valentino, the Madame Valentino Addendum by Michael Morris and yours truly, published by Renato Flores of Viale Industria Publicazione, and I quote, A Work in Heavenly Progress, an Introduction by Evelyn Zumaya. Ms. Flower Hewer sits before her vanity table mirror, an arc of light bulbs, addressing her 82-year-old face. The danseuse finesses. She's pleased with her makeup, hair, and silken wardrobe. Her coal-lined eyes smolder, and her blazing cheekbones leave no doubt. In the boudoir of her Astoria New York home, this grand dame scrutinizes the final touches on an entrance she has been anticipating for months. Flower Hewer is about to meet Father Michael Morris in the Russian Tea Room on 57th Street in New York City an historic restaurant where defining cultural moments take place. It was November 2, 1989, when Michael Morris, a 40-year-old Dominican friar from Berkeley, California, escorted Flower Hewer to dinner in the Russian tea room. He chose his setting wisely, a grand Russian modernist venue near Carnegie Hall, founded in 1927 by members of the Russian Imperial Ballet. Michael Morris and Flower Hewer had been exchanging letters and phone calls for a few years, but this dinner would be their only face-to-face meeting. Michael eagerly anticipated his coveted interview with a contemporary of Natasha Rambova, the subject of a biography he was then researching. Flower Hewer was once a student in Theodore Koslov's Imperial Russian Ballet School in Los Angeles. Natasha Rambova taught at Koslov's school, and was a prominent member of his retinue. Flower was but a ten-year-old when she began her ballet studies with Theodor Koslov and Natasha Rambova. But by the fall of 1989, her memories of those days gone by were still vivid. No photographs were taken during Ms. Hewer's Russian tea room dinner with Michael Morris, but she seized the opportunity to present him with an autographed black-and-white publicity photograph. The inscribed photograph was a recent portrait promoting her upcoming dance recitals. Despite her advanced age, a reviewer for the New York Times heralded her performances that year with a headline, Exotic Motions, with a Jolt of Presence. By 1989, Michael Morris had been researching his Rambova biography for almost 10 years, and Ms. Hewer was not the only Natasha Rambova contemporary he cleverly located and impressed. The interviews he conducted with those who knew her personally were many and provided him with a substantial and unique archive of first-hand accounts. This wealth of discovery would form the foundation of his Rambova biography published in 1991, which he titled Madame Valentino. End quote. In the spirit of this holiday season, and with a new year fast approaching, we honor Michael Morris's Natasha Rambova Rudolph Valentino legacy. How did his research change the narrative? What did Michael Morris prove about the death of Ramon Navarro? How was his work impeded by greedy Valentino memorabilia collectors and a Valentino cult? Today we discuss answers to these questions in this episode, Rudolph Valentino, Michael Morris, and more. Ciao! I am Renato Flores, the proud publisher of all the entertaining and documented books on Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova by Evelyn Zumaya. And I am also the proud publisher of Michael Morris' posthumous book, Beyond Valentino, the Madame Valentino Addendum. I'm here today with Evelyn to discuss more about her fascinating work. Ciao, Evelyn. Ciao, Renato. Uh, and as I just read in the opening excerpt, Flower Hewer gave Michael Morris a publicity photograph of herself during that dinner in 1989. As you know, I included that fabulous portrait of Ms. Hewer in Michael's posthumous book, which I co-authored and which you published and just mentioned, Beyond Valentino. Now, Flower Hewer's inscription on her photograph reads, quote, To Michael, with the greatest admiration for his beautiful project. End quote. Now, the beauty of Michael's project, Madame Valentino, has never been disputed. 
His biography of Natasha Rumbova remains the gold standard, in my opinion, for beautiful design, content, and lasting legacy. Madame Valentino, published in 1991 by Abbeville Press, is a polished and authoritative written book, and Ms. Hewer was not the only person to admire Michael's masterwork. Because of my work on Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rumbova, I was privileged to enjoy a close vantage point in Michael Morris's Life and Times, from the year 2000 until he passed away tragically in July of 2016. Michael Morris was our good friend and colleague, and after his passing, his family and literary executor asked me to complete the book we were collaborating on when Michael passed away. Of course, I would never have said no. It was then I was granted legal custody of his remarkable archive. Uh, you knew him, Renato, for some 20 years longer than I did, having met Michael in Los Angeles in the mid-1990s uh, when you worked on the Rye television documentary on Valentino uh, titled... Lo Sguardo di Valentino. Yes, Rudolph Valentino's Glance. Yes. Uh, I have mentioned previously how Michael sponsored my trip to the Valentino Conference here in Turin in 2009, where he and I delivered our speeches at the week-long International Valentino Conference. And yes, he introduced me to you at that conference's opening reception. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, but for six years prior to that Valentino Conference, Michael and I enjoyed a great collaboration and close friendship. And it was in this capacity I came to learn more about his role in the Valentino world and hear many backstories about Madame Valentino. It was not all smooth sailing, and I feel it is time to shed some light on those rocky waters Michael faced as the author of his beautiful project, Madame Valentino. In this episode, uh, I'm going to let Michael speak as much as possible by reading from my 16 years of email exchange with him. Now, all of these emails are held on servers where their accuracy and the IP addresses of the sender and recipient could be identified and verified. So I will not alter his words in any way. Michael, as anyone who has read his work knows, uh, was the absolute finest writer. And I will read some of his personal insight and eloquence shared with me in his emails uh, as his most literate illustration of this episode. Before you elaborate on this Madame Valentino backstories, perhaps you could tell our listeners who don't know who Michael Morris was and how he came to be known as the world scholar on Rambova. Who was Michael Morris? Uh, Michael Morris was born on October 19, 1949 in Santa Monica, California. He grew up in Los Angeles, and because of his father's connections, he knew some movie stars who I think had a great influence on him and inspired his fascination with old Hollywood, one in particular being the actress Loretta Young. Loretta Young was a devout Catholic, and I think she influenced Michael to go into the priesthood. Michael received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Southern California in 1971, and entered the Order of Friars Preachers for the Western Dominican province that same year. He was ordained a priest April 23, 1977. He was then known as Father Michael Morris, O.P., the O.P. standing for Ordo Predicatorum. Michael went on to earn his master's degree in art history from the University of California, Berkeley in 1981, and he studied at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London in 1982. And he earned his Ph.D. in art history from UC Berkeley in 1986. Now, during this time, he was also researching and writing Madame Valentino. Throughout the years, Michael also wrote a widely read regular article on religious art and iconography, which appeared in the Catholic magazine The Magnificat. Michael knew and befriended film stars who read his Magnificat articles, Tab Hunter and Mel Gibson, to mention two. And by the way, Mel Gibson retained Michael as a consultant when he was filming The Passion of the Christ, as an expert on stigmata. Now, Michael taught at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley and served as the director of the Santa Fe Institute there. He was an avid collector of vintage religious cinema posters, and at one point his collection uh, went on tour. And I know there's a great article with a picture of Michael with his poster collection online. 
uh, which appeared in the L.A. Times. This said Michael never ceased researching his favorite subject, Natasha Rombova, and he was one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met about the subject of Rombova and Valentino. How did the Dominican friar come to write a book on Natasha Rombova and Rudolf Valentino? I know he was often asked that question, and you have been asked the same many times. I have. I think this question, Renato, is best answered by Michael himself. And for this, we turn to an interview he granted with Dr. Vladimir Rossoff. Now, who is Dr. Rossoff? Uh, I quote page 471 in Beyond Valentino under the section titled Authors and Contributors, and I quote, Dr. Vladimir Rossoff is an historian and doctor of historical sciences. He is a renowned scholar of Russian emigre history and the heritage of the Russian painter Nicholas Rurich and his family. He has authored numerous publications which comprise more than 300 articles, brochures, monographs, and albums. He holds the position of head of the Rurich's Heritage Department at the State Museum of Oriental Art in Moscow and is also a member of the Union of Writers of Russia, end quote. Now, while completing Beyond Valentino after Michael's death, I worked with many scholars Michael was already working with at the time of his death. It was then the Rurich Society in New York put me in touch with Dr. Rossoff in Moscow, who so generously shared images that we included in Beyond Valentino, as well as the text of this interview he conducted with Michael in 1999. This interview was only published in Russian until we had it translated into English to include in the book. It is titled, Michael Morris, I Was Fascinated by My Rambova. The interview is included in its entirety in Beyond Valentino, by the way. But here we hear Michael explaining how he came to be so intrigued by Natasha Rambova. I excerpt Beyond Valentino from page 283. And I quote Michael. It's a long, interesting story, but I'll try to tell it briefly. I received a doctorate in art history from the University of California at Berkeley. Prior to my work on my doctoral dissertation, I completed my master's thesis with the focus and theme of this thesis being Aubrey Beardsley's illustrations for the play Salome. In the course of my studies, I discovered that a film was produced based on this play in which Beardsley's drawings were utilized in the design of the costumes and sets. These designs were the creation of a woman who was the wife of Rudolph Valentino. I was most interested in this production because Salome was the instrument that led to the death of John the Baptist. I had also been interested in the cinema for a long time, ever since my undergraduate studies at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. My particular interest in cinema was based upon two elements, religion and art. Therefore, soon after I discovered the Beardsley connection in this production, I was off to see the silent film Salome in a presentation in San Francisco. As I watched the film, I was amazed by how the scenery and costumes still held such fascination for me, despite the fact that the production was out of date being made in the 1920s with Alla Nazimova. I then realized I needed to learn much more about this woman Natasha Rombova, who is the artist creating such wonderful sets and costumes. Initially, I read only negative commentary about her. Soon, my interest in Rambova turned into a sort of hobby and then an obsession. By the time I was working on my doctoral thesis, which was devoted to Victorian paintings of monastic motifs, I kept my focus on Rambova, and it helped me to keep my peace of mind. In New York City, I was able to find a copy of Natasha Rambova's will, which identified several of her heirs. With the list as reference, I began to knock on doors, to call and write many letters. Many people found the time to share information about Rambova with me. The more I learned about this woman, the more she sparked my imagination, and the more I was drawn to her. At some point in my research, I decided that I should turn my attention into writing a book about her. This is how the book was born. It was odd, as people treated me as if I was a writer, although this was my first book. I always believed my first book would be some thesis on monks and Victorian art, but few people seemed interested in such a publication. There was interest in a book about Natasha Rombova. I think it is very important to realize the time frame when Michael was first 
researching Natasha Rambova. This was before the internet. Researching was a very different process than it is today. Now that is most definitely the case, Renato. Uh, Michael researched Madame Valentino during the 1980s, as I said, but before the advent of quick Google searches, people search engines, online photo buckets, Skype interviews and WhatsApp phone conversations and the wee transfers of documents. Uh, it was a much more laborious process then. Michael's word processing was literally to handwrite his notes on stacks of yellow legal pads. Uh, and I excerpt my introduction in regards to his research process and success. And I quote, Michael Morris researched and wrote Madame Valentino throughout the 1980s, just prior to the advent of the Internet. Consequently, a great deal of his research was conducted via handwritten letters. These letters included correspondence with two other members of Theodor Koslov's ballet troupe, Vera Fridova and Agnes DeMille, as well as Rombova's companion and secretary, Mark Hasselris. Michael's correspondence with other notables included Los Angeles District Attorney James Eidman, Bollingen Foundation editor William McGuire, writer and activist Dorothy Norman, and actress Patsy Ruth Miller. They fill some 100 folders in his unparalleled Rombova archive. Although Michael Morris published Madame Valentino in 1991 to rave reviews, he never ceased hoping for a way to share more of his archival materials. When I first met Michael in 2000, he was adamant that Madame Valentino was still a work in progress, end quote. In the course of his research, Michael's most valuable and notable contact was, of course, his connection with Rombova's cousin, Ann Wolin. She opened her family archive to Michael and gave him permission to reproduce it all in his Rombova work. Now, as receptive as most people were to Michael's request for interviews about Rombova, this was not always the case. Michael wrote to Jean Valentino, as he was then acting representative of the Valentino family, requesting an interview and possible use of images and other documents they could contribute. I read Jean Valentino's utter rejection letter in a previous podcast episode, and today I excerpt only his closing point made to Michael in a letter dated May 28, 1990. And I quote, Jean Valentino says, I do not know why I'm telling you all this when I do believe that it is better to let bygone be bygone. If you do have another motive to pursue the speculative career of a Natasha Rombova, I do think it is best to drop it. There is not too much I can add to her credits. This note is only very private and not for publication. There are now laws protecting the rights of privacy and the name of public characters for commercial speculation. I wish you would desist to pursue this topic any further. End quote. One of Michael's more rewarding contacts, James M. Eidman, uh, responded with a letter which would inspire Michael's inclusion in Madame Valentino of a postscript, which he titled A Tale of Murder and the Alleged Weapon, uh, refuting the Ramon Navarro death by dildo claim. Now, it was Kenneth Anger in his horrible books, Hollywood Babylon, who fabricated this salacious fantasy, which claims Valentino and Navarro were lovers and that Valentino gifted Ramon a dildo, which was used to murder him in 1968. Michael wrote and asked James Eidman for his comment on this claim, and Eidman responded as follows, and I quote, Dear Professor Morris, As you know, I was the deputy district attorney who prosecuted the killers of Ramon Navarro. I was intimately familiar with all of the evidence in the case. With reference to the claim that Mr. Navarro was choked to death by means of an Art Deco dildo, I can tell you that did not happen. I had never heard of the claim that was implicated in his death until I read your letter. I certainly never made any statement to the effect that such an instrument was used. I did not even know of its existence, if it existed. I hope that this will be of some assistance to you in your book. I will be looking forward to reading it when it is published. Please do not hesitate to write if there is anything further that I can do for you. Very truly yours, James M. Eidman, United States District Judge. End quote. So Michael not only refuted the claim that Novaro and Valentino were lovers, but also refuted any connection of said dildo to Novaro's death narrative. Now, in the same postscript, Michael also addressed the false Rombova narrative, which alleges she was a lesbian. 
Michael's addressing these subjects, however, riled those who believed that in making such a case, Michael was being homophobic. I can state, after having known Michael for 16 years, that he most certainly was not homophobic, and was, in fact, a serious researcher who was appalled with such undocumented fiction being passed off as fact. He included this in Madame Valentino in the interest of historical accuracy. I excerpt the postscript in Madame Valentino, which appears after Michael's revelations about Novaro's death. I quote uh, from page 264. If this murder weapon is fictitious, then so is the insinuation that Valentino and Novaro were connected to it in a friendship. Likewise, the convenient and related allegation that Natasha Rombova was a lesbian collapses when one scrutinizes the facts. When Anger's book appeared in America in the 1970s, the gay liberation movement was just getting underway. Coincidentally, during the same decade, Robert Flory, who was an intimate friend of Rudy and Natasha, wrote a Canadian biographer of Valentino a letter in which he declared that the stories of Rudy's homosexual liaisons were of recent origin. Nothing of this nature surfaced at the time of Rudy's death. The same holds true for Rambova. In the numerous interviews I conducted in the United States and Europe, those who had known Natasha Rambova personally presented me with a different picture of the woman than those would-be authorities I questioned who had never met her. This disparity called to mind Voltaire's cynical definition of history as the lie that everyone agrees upon. In the case of Rambova, the media has for several decades paraded fabrication as fact. The public has had little chance to know that the truth concerning Madame Valentino was far more compelling than the celebrated fiction, end quote. Now I'm going to read a couple of emails Michael wrote to me on the subject. This issue, which would instigate a rejection of his book by those controlling the false narrative that Ramon Navarro was killed by a dildo Valentino gave him, and the false narrative that both Rudy and Natasha were gay in their marriage, arranged and platonic. Uh, the first email uh, Michael wrote on March 3rd, 2004, and I quote, In all truth, when I began researching Rombova as a grad student in the art history department in Cal Berkeley, I did not question the already established myth that she was a predatory lesbian. In fact, as I recall in my master's thesis, uh, I refer to her as a lesbian. It was only later when I interviewed people who knew her and lived with her that the truth started to become evident. Not only was she not a lesbian, but she was something of a seductive nympho of the most heterosexual variety. That made me angry with the lack of credibility in so much of what passes itself off as, quote, cinema history. As for maligning me for no longer accepting their party line, I don't care if they call it my, quote, version of the truth. For those who drain their so-called scholarship of any honesty, truth is a relative concept to begin with. They will forever feel comfortable in their homegrown fantasies, end quote. The next one is dated May 5th, 2003. The letters Bill Self had that I saw were written by Natasha in English and pencil on yellow legal-sized paper, perfectly preserved in plastic. It was her handwriting. Bill didn't let me hold them long. All I remember is the line, quote, I am too tired to go on fighting, end quote, with a suggestion that maybe divorce would be best. Besides, my book was already published. There wasn't much I could do about any newly found material at that point. But what I like about your book and whatever Bill is doing with his information is that it supports my material. The whole world seems to disagree with me. From Brett, who says that Rudy and Natasha were exclusively gay, to Leiter, who says Rudy was a bi guy and Natasha was probably a little lezzy on the side because she made Chinese pajamas and left a token in her will. Uh, hardcore lesbian evidence there. Thus the focus shifts in these other books to the real passionate love story that was the point of my book. The stuff you have uncovered from the Alma manuscript makes me jump for joy, because there in all its painful messiness is evidence of the intensity of their love for each other, coupled with the anger of being betrayed, again by each other, for his blocking her from the set and his resentment about her lover and not being able to control the powers around them that were pulling them apart. This is the story that will rivet the reader's attention. This is the story that needs to be reaffirmed so as to dislodge Natasha Rambova and Rudolph Valentino 
from that boring jail cell of sexual ambiguity and self-centeredness in which so many writers feel happy to confine them. Now, off to school, signed Michael. And the last one on this subject uh, was written on May 7, 2003, a few days later. I am amazed by Janine Bassinger's bluntness when she says on page 308 of her book, Silent Stars, quote, Rudy is not a hip, cutting-edge, bisexual figure, but a creature out of a romance novel. He is there to rip bodices. This is borne out by the fact that male viewers seem to hate him so much. These men clearly just resented Valentino and wanted to discredit his sexuality. She didn't get one thing, though. Most of the male biographers of Valentino were slash are gay, and they discredit his sexuality because they are in love with him and they want him to love them back. It's the same dynamic that motivates the female fans of Rudy, the mythic god making love to the viewer, except that the gay male must destroy Valentino's heterosexual sex in order to make him a participant of their homosexual desire. End quote. When Madame Valentino was published uh, in 1991, Michael received many wonderful cards and letters of praise and many rave reviews. These are all preserved in his archive. But there was an unmistakable undercurrent of rejection and dismissal by those invested in perpetuating the gay Valentino and Rambova narrative. They were not pleased, not at all. Now, I have to clarify that this was not just a question of a few people not liking Madame Valentino. These people wielded and still wield an enormous influence and hold the controlling share in the Valentino legacy. They collectively have a very loud voice. Now, according to Michael, Madame Valentino was also criticized for his not questioning Rombova's spiritual activities, such as the seances she held in France, uh, which I wrote about in Astral Affairs Rombova. I will let Michael speak on that, and I excerpt an email written to me on June 24, 2003, uh, and I quote, when Madame Valentina was being reviewed by the New York Times, I was excoriated for leading the readers on about the expedition into the supernatural as if it were a valid route to take. I was criticized for being unquestioning or uncritical of the Wainer seances. The reason I was uncritical is because I wanted the reader to feel as Natasha did herself, holding on to Wainer and his seances as the only thread that kept Natasha and Rudy connected at this great moment of transition. Either I was unsuccessful in my attempt, or else the reviewer didn't get it. He just thought that I believed in Wainer's revelations, and that was that. I still think she wrote that, so as to give the impression to the readers that she and Rudy were connected on a higher plane that nobody else could understand, and so as to exonerate her from the blame by fans who would see her desertion of him as the key to his untimely death. And Michael refers to this excoriation, as he called it, in his speech delivered in 2009. And we share now a clip of audio from his speech. When my biography of Natasha Rambova first appeared 18 years ago, it received some excellent reviews, but it also revived an avalanche of controversy for the fact that it dared to propose that the wife of Rudolf Valentino was both his intimate lover and his artistic muse. She was the most hated woman in Hollywood, declared the reviewer in the New York Times, whose sweeping statement betrayed the fact that he would like to have seen her remain as such in a popular but falsely created niche in history as a meddlesome harpy dismissed as nothing more than the girlfriend of Ala Nazimova, who was ambitiously linked to Rudolf Valentino in a marriage of convenience that would further her career in Hollywood at the expense of his. In order to logically present my case and establish Natasha Rambova as an important artist in her own right, worthy of reevaluation, and as a woman who was the object of Valentino's spiritual and physical affection, I had to deconstruct the rumors that had imprisoned the famous couple ever since the book Hollywood Babylon first appeared in 1975, with its farrago of fact mixed with a lot of fiction. The author of that book and its sequel, Kenneth Anger, 
set out to recast many of the idols of Hollywood history by presenting them in a new and uncomplimentary light. With the authoritative air of one who had been a bit player in an early Hollywood production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the former child actor turned avant-garde film director attempted to expose the peccadillos of Hollywood's rich and famous, lacing his stories with a clever yet vicious and ironic humor that made an indelible imprint on the image of film culture. His work overshadows the less flamboyant and more scholarly accounts of cinema history and biography. Feasting on dead celebrities has become a highly successful publishing endeavor ever since then. But its entertainment value threatens the legacy of the relatively new art form of the cinema, whose authentic chroniclers must separate fact from fiction, history from hearsay, truth from theory. In Hollywood Babylon, Anger declared that Rambova and Valentino had never consummated their marriage, that Valentino and fellow actor Ramon Navarro were lovers, and that Navarro was murdered by an Art Deco dildo that, Rud uh, that Rudy had given him 45 years earlier. All of these claims I felt I disproved in my own book. But it has been difficult to dislodge the colorful lies that survive in proportion to their own audacity. But I did not come here to Turin to fight old battles. Others are here in this august assembly ready to present new material that will reinforce my stance on the Valentino marriage and shed new light on the character of Natasha Rambova and Rudolph Valentino. Instead, I came here to look more closely at the artistic influence of Natasha Rambova, examine the reasons that compelled her to pursue the artistic course she did, and divulge some interesting facts that I was prohibited from including in my book when it was published. It's so good to hear Michael's voice. But I know you found evidence in his archive of problems he had with his publisher, Abbeville and his agent at the time of Madame Valentino's publication. I did. Well, his beautiful book thrilled most of his readers. Behind the scenes, he was not happy with Abbeville Press. Uh, and in his archive, I found letters between Michael, his then agent, uh, his literary agent, and Abbeville, attesting to this situation. Michael believed the book would be in full color and was disappointed when it was released in halftones and he was told he would regain the full rights to Madame Valentino once the book was out of print. To circumvent surrendering the rights back to Michael, Abbeville had the book published in Spain, without his authority initially, uh, to maintain the rights longer. He would also fire his agent over these conflicts, so I was sorry to read about the problems and this side of this beautiful book's history. The iconic image of Rambova on the back cover of Madame Valentino as its own backstory, which Michael shared with you. Uh, yes, he did. Michael worked with the Rurich Foundation in New York City while researching Natasha's affiliation with the Rurich Society and her relationship with the heir apparent to the Rurich legacy, Svetoslav Rurich. It was one of Michael's regrets that he did not include uh, the details of Natasha's engagement and love affair with Svetoslav in Madame Valentino. And this was the reason he spoke about this in his speech in turn in 2009 to set that record straight. He felt Svetoslav was Rambova's greatest love. He told me he made this omission in Madame Valentino in exchange for using that image of Rambova on the book's cover, the portrait of Natasha painted by her then lover Svetoslav. But he also mentioned another explanation. I read from two emails Michael wrote to me about this. Uh, and I quote, I wasn't denied information about Natasha Rambova's torrid love affair with Rurich because Fetty was still alive. I was denied it because there were some jealous old female trustees who hated Natasha for taking their boyfriend away from them. Apparently those old dames still held their flame in high regard, and I suspect they blame Natasha Rambova for making him move back to India. There may be some truth in that. The father, Nicholas Rurich, the only artist ever nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, called him back there when he learned his son was dallying with a movie star, uh, yet he ended up marrying one. The second email, I quote, Yes, Evelyn, cover new material on Natasha Rambova and add to the body of knowledge I pioneered. 
Here are some areas in particular where I still have questions. The extent of her love relationship with Svetoslav Rurich. He painted the beautiful portrait of her on the back of my book, How I Would Love to Own That Painting. It is at the Rurich Museum in New York City, stuck in a closet. Daniel Enton is the curator there. He knows all the secrets which I was not able to print or pursue if the trustees were to give me permission to have the painting in my book. Photographs of Sveti, as Natasha called him, abound at the museum, and you'll see why Natasha was attracted to him. He is the European type she fell for, and when Sveti's father called him to India, afraid that his son's nobler purpose would be tarnished by a Hollywood actress, Natasha tried to sue him for a breach of promise. In 1990, when I was writing my book and uncovering all this, some of the old names who were trustees were women who had themselves been in love with Sveti, and they refused to allow me access to the real story. End quote. So with his relationship with Madame Valentino's publisher on shaky ground, his agent gone, and an unauthorized version of his book being distributed in Spain, and with the resistance to his work because of his authoritative refuting of the portrayal of Rambova as a lesbian, he faced some problems. But I will say in regards to the problems with his agent and publisher, he took that in stride. But I found him to be more defensive in response to those people rejecting his documentation in regards to Natasha and Rudy's marriage and their individual sexual orientation. I was certainly witness to this as we began to collaborate, and in this we shared a literary predicament, and that we both were facing the censorship by the false narrative overlords. When Michael and I met, we then lived about 20 minutes away from each other, and our very lively Valentino Rambova conversation, which began then, would not cease until a few days before his death 16 years later. We both being extremely chatty people, emailed and called by phone, and met often to analyze every possible aspect of my research and our favorite subjects, Rudy and Natasha. In all aspects of my research, he had some analysis or insight to offer, which was almost always valuable. I usually took his suggestions. I think the only advice I ever rejected for him for Affairs Valentino was his idea for Rudolph Valentino's death scene. He thought I should have him reaching heaven where he was met by his mother, but I wrote what I felt I had to write, as you know. Uh, Michael was a founding father of the love child theory, which I present in Affairs Valentino. And when I faltered, thinking it could not possibly be true, he pushed me forward suggesting new research possibilities. As we discussed the possible love child theory in an email thread dated September 3 to 4, 2003, I'm going to read a few selections. Here he writes, If Gene was married in the church in L.A., he would have to produce a baptismal certificate before his marriage. It would have been recorded in the church where he was married, as well as in the church in Italy where he was baptized. Records, records, records. It's all a leftover from the Roman Empire. Interestingly, my great aunts and grandparents never got birth certificates in their day. They had to hand in baptismal records for proof of birth date. And the next one, he writes, Rudy's mother was already dead by the time he met Natasha, no? I think that's why his motherly affection turned towards Aunt Tessie as a substitute. The sister Maria thought Natasha was something of a loose woman for her liberal use of coal and other makeup. Her conservative stance could well reflect a country Catholic family's attitude towards sex and morals that would propel them to send Rudy packing when suddenly Jean popped into their lives. The L.A. Obed is curious for its lack of mentioning where he came from, what town, when did he first arrive in America, who were his parents. I fear that you will not find many clues in the way of civil documents. The studios could permanently erase any uncomfortable facts about its stars on the civil record, I would try to zero in on church records. The next one, he says, Your theory may also explain why Natasha did not want to accompany Rudy any further than Rome. She returned to the chateau in France while he visited his family at the bottom of the boot. Why should his new wife want to get involved in the mess Rudy left behind there? Was Jean's mother still living in the village? Did Rudy want to grab Jean and bring him back to Hollywood? 
This must have caused tension between Rudy and Natasha, and would best explain why the newlyweds parted. And the last mention, uh, I quote, I think that the social security document might add new light, if only insofar as to reveal whether or not his vital info is consistent with that found on the other documents. Leave no stone unturned. Interesting reflection. There are no photos that I know of showing Natasha and Jean together, but there are photos of Alberto with Natasha Rambova and Rudy. If Alberto visited the chateau, why didn't Jean? Or did he? Uh, it was Michael Morris who encouraged me to research Valentino's sexual orientation and write the article I titled Words of Clarification, which was based on the results of my research. And then, without my knowledge, he submitted this article to the University of Turin Organizing Committee for the conference held in 2009. Michael generously edited my manuscript as I wrote, offering scholarly edits and direction. Now, there's no doubt that Michael's open affiliation with me caused more problems for him, especially after I naively announced on a popular Valentino chat room around 2003 that he had loaned me his vast archive for use in my research. The minute I made this announcement that he even had this valuable archive, the Valentino family finally took note and deemed him worthy of contact. Now, bear in mind here, Renato, that the Valentino family had yet to contact Michael throughout the 14 years since Madame Valentino was published. Except for Jean Valentino's request, he cease work on the beautiful project. But after I made my announcement, Michael learned that the Valentino family spokeswoman wanted to speak with him. And I excerpt a couple of emails from Michael about this, uh, dated April 28, 29, 2004. He writes, from the sound of the email and Bill Self's attitude, I take it that he and Janine are in constant communication, like you and me. In fact, he said that he has read the first draft of her manuscript and thought it was good, though I don't see how it could be a good dissertation and at the same time a good commercial success. I plan to continue my communication with Bill insofar as I still have questions that need answering but I owe nothing to the family spokeswoman and will wait for her to approach me. That is something she may not do since I presume her pride knows no bounds. Besides, it will get back to her through Bill's conversation that her grandfather treated me quite shabbily. And the second quote, he says, Bill Self said that Jean's granddaughter wants to get in touch with me, and he expressed some unease at keeping all the warring factions he's friendly with in line lest his embassy be blown up in future disputes and lawsuits. Apparently, the Valentino family wants some stuff back, but he says he hasn't given up much yet, end quote. So, Michael introduced you to Valentino collector Bill Self. Uh, he did, Renato, and he and Self had a good relationship. Michael met Self after Madame Valentino was published, but as I said, Michael never ceased in his sincere Rumbova researching and he was eager to specifically read those letters Self had then, uh, in which Rambova wrote to Valentino about their separation, where she addresses her affair with D, whom Michael believed to be a cameraman, Devereux Jennings. I think Self taunted Michael with that last letter from Natasha, and Self did this with me about such things as just promising to show me Rudolf Valentino's United Artists contract. And I quote Michael, a small quote here from an email, where he says, Bill didn't have that much on Natasha Rambova's lover, but he gave me all he knows or he can surmise about him. He didn't show me the Pinkerton report, but quoted it, and also gave me two juicy quotes from Natasha's last letter to Rudy. As you know, Renato, I like to think Michael's analytical emails with me are so insightful that I would like to publish them someday. Uh, I know people would find them fascinating. And of course, I selected a few examples here to share that I found while sorting the emails for this episode. He writes here, quote, I admire your defense of Ullman. He needs a defender just like Rambova needed one. I especially admire how his kids have met the challenge to defend his name. Isn't it interesting when your book comes out of all the characters in this fascinating ensemble? It is George Ullman who will have the last laugh. Uh, in the next email I want to share, he writes about the woman Natasha. 
and I quote, The woman Natasha had two faces. She smoked like a fiend, but never did so in public. It was all image, like that crazy hairdo. What a pain to have it done up like that every day, with a turban on top, but from every angle it always looked spectacular. What must it have been like when they were together, and not having to impress anyone? What was it like when they were at home, alone, and just relating to each other? Those are the questions I have, end quote. And the next email, uh, dated February 13th, 2003, he uh, sends me a quote which I requested to use. Hi, Evelyn, sure you can quote me, but I wanted to refine the quote so it was a little more specific and a little more elegant. Here it is. I think the fact that love soured between Valentino and Rombova made Natasha very appealing to lesbians because she was so beautiful, dominating, and self-possessed. If she could walk away from the world's greatest male lover, then it is automatically assumed that she must have preferred women. What people don't bother to investigate was the fact that her lovers both before and after Rudy were all strikingly handsome debonair European men. Rudy was just one among many. Now, if you want to be more specific, you can name the loves of her life. Theodore Kosloff, Russian. Rudolf Valentino, Italian. Nicholas Rurich, Russian. Alvaro de Ursaiz, Spaniard, and quite possibly, though I have no proof, Alexander Pienkov, Russian. The only time she betted a non-European was when she had the affair with a cameraman during her estrangement from Rudy. I don't have his name, but Bill Self does, and he even has the Pinkerton police report on him, which Rudy paid for when he had her followed by a private detective. I wish you would follow up on that. End quote. Uh, and some more insight in this email. And I quote, Hi, Evelyn, you hit it on the head. Yes, Natasha was conscious of her control and exercised it with great skill. But it backfired on her when Rudy suddenly died. It sent her into a terrible bout of grief that could only be assuaged through seances. I think that marked her for the rest of her life and made her particularly vulnerable to charlatan spiritualists. On the other hand, one must also take into the consideration her own wounds. All of her lovers betrayed her. Kosloff screwed other girls and shot her. Rudy signed a contract against her. Sveti walked out on a marriage promise to her and ran away to Asia with Daddy. Alvaro took up with the maid. She lived earnestly for all these men, to the point of endangering her health, and they all wounded her terribly, not to mention her mother. Muzzy dumped her in England at too young an age to be without your mother. No wonder she never wanted children. It was one of the most painful stages of her life, and she had no paradigm for how to even act as a mother. It's no wonder that Natasha developed those skills in becoming something of an enchantress. It was a desperate mode for survival. With your wonderful new data, Evelyn, you can paint a much more vivid picture of this complex woman than I was able to do and at the same time redeem her reputation, which, despite all my efforts, is still being trashed, end quote. And the last one I'll share about Natasha's play, All That Glitters. He writes, I was reading Glitters last night. It's one of those lightweight comedies with a twist that they used to stage so often in the 1920s and 30s. But what makes this rise above the mediocrity is the veiled satire of real-life people Rombova knew. In many ways, this piece of stage fluff is a wife's revenge. For instance, Marcel Marson, the dark exotic type, is obviously a combo of Nitinalti, who Rombova should have mistrusted alone with her husband, and either Gloria Swanson or Pola Negri, one of the titled movie stars for the wedding faded European royalty. It almost demands an annotated version, revealing the true to life story behind the veiled references. End quote. So I do think Michael's being a Dominican friar, Renato, restricted what he did and said publicly. But behind the scenes, Michael was an enormous influence on Affairs Valentino. I know Michael came under attack for supporting your work. And the people who called themselves the team, or as Michael called them, the cult, they came after him online and in a terrible way. It was terrible, uh, and they did. Michael did not hide the fact that he brought me to Turin in 2009 to deliver our speeches and mine on the sexual orientation of Valentino. 
and he did come under heavy attack online, specifically from the person I refer to as the Valentino porn fiction writer. And by the way, it was Michael who insisted I always call him this. Uh, The online onslaught of abuse of Michael Morris came about in this way. A bit of background. In my first edition of Affairs Valentino, published in 2011, after a year of being savaged online by these cultist, vicious lies about me and my work, I included an introduction titled, A Forewarning. I wrote this admittedly lengthy introduction as an explanation why people would find all of this outrageous crap about the book and me online. I exposed the situation. Michael proofed the forewarning and made only one addition. He added five words, the magus of the cult. Now, I know he denied in an email to said magus that he wrote the forewarning or had anything to do with it. He did not write it, and it was always my sole responsibility uh, what I published, obviously. Uh, It was always a consideration that Michael was a priest, and as I just mentioned, this put restrictions on his public image. With the publication of that forewarning, the porn fiction writer and the Magus of the Cult came out raging, and the porn fiction writer actually wrote to Michael's superior at the diocese in Berkeley, uh, I guess trying to have him fired from the church, accusing him of writing the forewarning. And it was then, around 2013 or so, that this porn fiction writer began referring to Michael in his daily online salacious and disgusting posts as Padre Liberace. Now, I ask how someone, such as the porn fiction writer, call himself a champion of gay rights when he ridicules someone by calling them gay. This is a high level of homophobia, in my opinion. I add that this same person also attacked Michael mercilessly and sadistically in the days after his death. This online filth was noted by Michael's doctoral student, who took on the task of defending his beloved advisor and mentor, Michael Morris. What a hero this young man is. In any case, back in the day, Michael stood firm as we both then faced this online abuse. But Michael, he did not suffer the fools. And he wrote in this email dated October 22nd, 2015, uh, and I quote, I only got a partial picture of what Renato sent and it didn't mention my name, but from, from what I could glean, I suspect the porn fiction writer is railing against me for using the name Lea Sim Sarome in my review for your book. At that time, as I remember, one could use code names and nicknames in their reviews was not a bad review. It was a great one. I do not see the relevance at this point. Nevertheless, I'm willing to come out fighting with full colors now, and I do not fear Valentino porn fiction writer slash Satan any longer. You can use my real name for the back of your book and quote me as saying, quote, this is the best researched book about Rudolph Valentino ever written. Michael Morris, biographer of Natasha Rumbova and author of Madame Valentino. Don't bother to resend me Valentino Porn Fiction writer's ravings. I really don't think anybody reads his crap except his handful of depraved friends, end quote. I remember it was about 2013 when we began working on his addendum to Madame Valentino, beyond Valentino. Uh, It was, and from the first time Michael and I met, he often spoke about publishing this addendum to Madame Valentino. And by 2013, he'd already begun researching his new book. And incredibly, he found and contacted a gentleman in Mallorca who'd recently discovered an elderly woman, Maria Salome, whose parents worked as Rambova and her second husband, Alvaro's maid and handyman on Mallorca. Now, Miss Salome, who has since passed away, was in possession of the great archive of Rambova relics. The negotiations for the images of this woman's incredible collection were underway. Michael was very excited about the new Mallorcan images uh, and the story for his addendum. Michael also asked me to publish his new book, and I was very happy and honored to be part of this project. Uh, Michael and I, uh, and you, we worked rather sporadically, devising an outline for the book, and he began sorting images and sending them to me. Uh, I add that throughout, Michael remained on a quest to find that letter which Rambova wrote to Valentino after their separation. 
the letter which he knew Bill Self had, and which Self gave Michael only a few seconds to peruse, and then, as Michael said, he gave him a couple of juicy details. Michael so wanted to be able to include this vital document in his new book. Uh, he was driven to find that letter to include, as well as amend his omission of Rambova's engagement to Svetoslav Rurich. And on that subject, he wanted Beyond Valentino to be an extension of the speech he delivered in 2009. Uh, he also wanted to include in his new book some of Rambova's Egyptological life's work, titled The Cosmic Circuit, her essay Arriba España, or Up Spain, which she wrote about her experiences in the Spanish Civil War. Now, this had never been published, and he also planned to include her play All That Glitters with an analysis in the form of a conversation between the two of us. I know you thought at first this was a bad idea, the conversation between the two of you in Beyond Valentino. I did, Renato. I told Michael that if my name were to be on the book, these same people who call themselves the team, again, who Michael called the cult, would begin posting lies about his book as they were about mine to ruin the sales. The disaster of lies that befell my work and Affairs Valentino would surely happen to his addendum. But again, Michael stood strong, despite. And when I suggested we not include the dialogue between us about all that glitters, he wrote we could not, and I quote, let the devil's brigade run our lives. So work on the new book was underway, and I excerpt my introduction to Beyond Valentino, and I quote, Our initial efforts included the exchange of hundreds of emails as we debated how best to present the disparate elements or miscellany he wished to include. We designed several preliminary book covers, devised an outline, and began to organize Michael's enormous archive of correspondence and photographs. Our work remained sporadic until the spring of 2016. It was then Michael received a terminal diagnosis. He wrote to tell me the unthinkable news and without pause turned to the subject of the completion of this book with a time's a-wastin'. Despite the obvious challenges, we resolved to work diligently depending on his physical well-being. By the end of June, this book was moving towards completion and due for publication by the end of 2016 in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the publication of Madame Valentino. On July 8th, I sent Michael an email with news I would soon forward a revised cover design. He responded with a brief email saying, Great, wonderful. Those were his last words to me. Seven days later, on July 15th, Michael Morris passed away. I knew he was gravely ill, yet I expected some sort of recovery, extended treatment, and a little more time. News of his sudden death hit hard, and during the ensuing days of mourning, the fate of Michael's Beyond Valentino remained in question. In September, I traveled to Berkeley, California, to meet with his family and his literary executor. They made the decision that I would complete Michael's last work. Shortly after this meeting, I received his entire magnificent Rombova archive, it was then I realized Michael had left me the seeds with which to plant and nurture to fruition his beautiful garden that it had been his dream for 25 years. As the contents of those unwieldy boxes of files unfolded, discoveries were made, new directions in research were required of me, and unexpected twists and turns rendered the task before me overwhelming. So I proceeded to follow Michael's outline, negotiate with his contacts, and obviously, it was a heavy project then, and an emotional one. I was, however, happy to be able to successfully complete some of Michael's ongoing research. I located the family of Natasha's companion during the last 20 years of her life, Mark Hasselris, and I was thrilled when they contributed great photographs and more details of his life story. I contacted the Rurich Society and Dr. Rossoff, as I mentioned earlier, and Dr. Rossoff, who is writing a biography in Russian on Svetoslav, confirmed that Svetoslav and Natasha were engaged for three years. I also learned from a Rurich contact in Spain that it was not Papa Rurich, Nicholas Rurich, who called his son back to India, as Michael believed, but Mother Helena, who felt Natasha Rambova was the reincarnation of Bathsheba and a bad influence on her son's karma. I wish Michael had lived to know this one detail. It would take me one year to complete Michael's posthumous book, 
and a new contract was negotiated with his Dominican diocese, and it was they who requested my name be cited as co-author. I included everything I could, which I knew Michael wanted in the book, because I knew, obviously, he would not be revisiting the subject of Rombova again, and it became a mighty tome. So you know, Renato, in hindsight, Michael was always full of energy and reveled in his role as Rombova scholar. He was generous with his knowledge and time. But I also knew him to be bitter, realizing that despite his authoritative work on Rombova and Valentino, the undocumented surmise that gay narrative continued with such force, while authors such as him and me, who dared to question the premise, were literally being persecuted. And I found it personally disgusting, I'm going to say, that the very people who led this persecution came out after Michael's death to praise him and Madame Valentino. Now, he deserved that praise, but they certainly were not doing that during his life. Michael did so much to rehabilitate Rombova's tarnished reputation, or as he called it, trashed reputation, which these people feed even today by portraying her as the emasculating, selfish lesbian harpy, which, by the way, I find so very homophobic and misogynistic. Michael faced a twofold challenge in upholding the legacy of Madame Valentino. One being the opposition to and dismissal of his portrayal of the hated Rombova as a much maligned heterosexual woman who was the primary influence in creating Valentino's screen persona. And two, the fact that much of the great source material he should have had access to was withheld and as part of a calculated censorship and part of a monetary gambit benefiting collectors. The letters from Natasha to Rudy, which Self had, and the Valentino family certainly knew about, were never shared with Michael during his research process, which Jean Valentino, I think, should have provided to Michael. And even after Madame Valentino was published, Michael was deprived the opportunity to even read them. How valuable these would have been to his work and his Rombova scholarship. I know it is claimed that in sharing them, this would compromise their monetary value, and to this uh, argument I say bullshit. It would only increase the value. And knowing what I do today about the sad state of affairs in the Valentino world, I allege this material is hidden and not shared because it does not support the gay narrative. I add, as I have addressed this in previous episodes, that the Valentino family spokeswoman, when she came in contact with Michael, asked him to loan her a great portion of his archive for her research, citing the fact that he did the same for me. Michael granted her the loan, and all of those materials he loaned her were never returned and have disappeared, gone. When he died, he was threatening legal action for their retrieval. So as Flower Hewer inscribed her photograph for Michael at that dinner in New York in 1989, expressing her admiration for his beautiful project, could she or Michael have ever foreseen what he would go through as a result? I have posted the video of Michael's speech delivered at the Valentino Conference in 2009 on our YouTube channel, and the link to that video and your speech also is included in the caption of this episode. And as always, please find all of our books, which I am so proud of, on Amazon. And I want today for our listener to please note that we were contacted by the woman who executed the excellent translation of the Robert Flory piece, The Magic Lantern which we provide in our episode Rudolf Valentino, The Magic Lantern and more. Mm -hmm. We want to acknowledge and thank Madame Valérie Verneuil for her translation from the French. Merci beaucoup, Madame. In closing today, I want to say that recently I was in receipt of a remarkable archive of documents sent to me online. Because there are those of you out there who want the truth about these two icons known, who understand the censorship of this valuable history, and who send important documents my way. Thank you. Now, this archive I received included telegrams sent by and to Valentino 
at the time of his separation from Rombova, and it included a few pages of the Pinkerton detective report, as well as photographic images of a letter. Yes, this was the letter Self had in his collection, which Michael so desperately wanted to read, the letter Natasha wrote to Rudy after their separation, which was so raw with regret, remorse, loss, and heartache. This is the very letter Michael so hoped to include in Beyond Valentino. Well, it came along a bit late for that, but today I close this episode by reading this letter in its entirety. And I quote Natasha, Rudy Darling, as this is the last letter I shall ever write you, I am asking you to read it through. Mr. Allman just showed me the wire from Gilbert, and I am going to explain to you what you don't know. I know you are very suspicious, and you have cause to be, but I think in your heart you will know whether or not I am telling you the truth. In any case, it will not matter, as I shall not see you again. As you probably know, I have not seen him for a long time. And since I returned from, and her handwriting writes as city with the beginning, beginning with the letter C, and we had our little talk and understanding. I have been hoping that everything would come out all right, and I know in your heart you know that is the truth. But as you have very often told me, for what we do in this world we pay for and generally heavily. It was all very well for you to say, break it off and never see him again. But my darling, if you use a little reasoning power, you may understand that things aren't as easily finished as all that. As you know, he had everything to gain and nothing to lose. And since our first talks, when I wouldn't believe anything, I have learned quite a bit, unfortunately. As I told Mr. Ullman, he has been very persistent and has written pleading notes and letters, threatening to do all kinds of foolish things. I did not see him again. I thought it would be all right after he said he would go to New York. But then, as you prophesied, he could not get the contract or the money. So I thought it would help if I took a trip and hoped that when I came back, things would cool down and be forgotten by the time I returned. Then came the announcement of my leaving in the newspapers, and I received a note saying he positively had to see me. It was something serious before I went away, hence the meeting. I drove there in a taxi, which waited for me, while well, I talked to him not more than ten minutes, right there on the street. I told him I was going away to forget, and that I could never see him again. That it was goodbye for always. He asked me to kiss him once, goodbye, which I did. You will not understand, I know. But, Rudy, I have been worried and frightened, and I have tried to break this off as gradually and agreeably as I could, as I did not want to make him mad or have any scandals, and when I came back, I was relieved and happy to think that maybe I had done it. That is all. The following lines are a little bit difficult to read her handwriting. And I quote, And she names a man's name beginning with D. He was right. He said things were going to be much worse, even than they had been. And that I would come through, it looks like, on the train. But he also said I would come back from New York. But in that, I am afraid he was wrong. But that is life, I suppose when I really was trying to make things right, that I should make them so wrong. Why complain? We must all pay for our mistakes, and I have, and shall go on paying for mine. I only wish you had not been so sweet and loving when I last saw you. And your card on the basket, it made me cry, and now I know why. When I stood there waving you out of sight, I wanted you so, and felt so lonesome, as if I should never see you again. I suppose it was a premonition of what was going to happen. I suppose one never really learns until it's too late. Oh, darling, if you only knew how I wish you were here. I do want my pillow to cry on so badly, and I won't ever have it any more. No matter whatever comes in this life, sweetheart, you were my first real love and you will be my last one, regardless of the many things I have said to hurt you. But as you know me, you will know that my pride may be, made me say things I did not mean. So now I will always know to carry the memory of only the beautiful things if I can. And just remember the happy times we did have. And life has been better in many ways. I suppose I should be grateful for having had at least one or two years of real happiness. But darling, my heart will be very empty without my babykins. What shall I do? 
I do not know, and it does not matter now. But you will always know that somewhere I shall be watching your life and hoping for your happiness and success, which I hope will wipe out the unhappiness I brought into it. With my arms around you, my darling, I give you my last kiss, Natasha. End quote. For today, fiat justitia, ruat celum, e buon Natale a tutti. <laughs>